Good afternoon, everybody who's uh, just coming into the webinar. Um, my name is Mark Bailey. I'm the IT Chairman at the Royal Fair Tech Society London. And I'm very pleased to see uh, that we have already 74 people attending. This is a webinar. Uh, so for those of you who've used Zoom before, this is not a Zoom meeting. It's slightly different. Um, we on the panel cannot see you, nor indeed can we hear you. Um, what we can do, though, is uh, as we get through the, the presentation, you'll be able to, at any point, raise questions, which we'll deal with at the end of the presentation. There's a Q&A button uh, on the control bar at the bottom of your screen when you put your mouse over the Zoom window, and you can uh, click on the Q&A button, and then you can type your question into there. And as I say, um, we'll, we'll ask uh, the questions at the end. I would like to now introduce uh, Mr. Richard Stock. He's the president of the Royal Fair Tech Society London and a fellow of the, of the society. And this afternoon, he's going to explain to us all about preparing a PowerPoint presentation. So over to you, Richard. Thank you very much indeed, Mark. Good afternoon, everybody, wherever you are. On the opening slide, you will see the picture that was taken of the attendees at the first meeting held at 15 Abchurch Lane, our new premises. We hope that in the next few months, we will be able to get back to that sort of situation and a degree of normality. This subject of planning and preparing a PowerPoint presentation will deal with those presentations that are made to philatelic audiences, as well as including uh, a, a philatelic presentation to a non-philatelic audience, uh, basically history of letter writing and the carriage of mail. But to start, there are a number of key issues for all PowerPoint presentations, which I think most uh, presenters regard as essential. Firstly, that it's important to plan the presentation. It's a well-known adage that uh, without a project plan, then failure comes as a complete surprise. Uh, secondly, to tell a story. If you've got a good story to tell and you can support it with very good demonstrative illustrations in the form of philatelic material and ephemera, photographs, etc., then that does highlight the story that you want to tell. Also a structure to the presentation is essential. You may be dealing with a detailed subject in which you can plan each section of it in detail, or you may be faced with dealing a very large subject, in which case you've either got to choose between doing a very high level overview of the whole topic or picking one section of it and doing that in, in detail as if it were uh, a much more detailed presentation overall. Another key aspect is to secure audience attention from the outset, and that means that you need a good opening slide, which is going to draw people's attention to the subject, and you need also to be able to try and test their reaction. Unfortunately, with a virtual-only presentation, it's not possible to do that, and that is the one point that most presenters, because we've done a lot of these during my presidency, most presenters have said to me afterwards that there is no way in which you can judge how the audience is receiving your presentation. When it's a physical one, you can look at the faces, you can see if people are laughing when they're supposed, when you want them to laugh, or whether, whether or not they're taking it seriously. But that's not possible. So it's a bit lonely when you're doing a virtual only presentation. Humour is also very important because one of the things that you have the opportunity to do is to entertain the audience. So pick out the humorous stories, the humorous envelopes, etc., etc., and the stories that you can tell about how you acquired a particular item. The last essential thing to do, I think, is to practice the presentation before you actually undertake it, particularly if you haven't, if you're fairly new to. Uh, PowerPoint presentations and have only done one or two of them uh, before. 
Okay, moving on then to the plan itself, that describes the scope of the presentation, and that's largely, that's entirely up to you as to how much description you put into it, but you don't want the plan to be too extensive. It must, however, be complete. Very good idea to have a clear and logical structure to it, and also to summarize the main topics. You can then drill down into the detail of each of those topics in preparing the individual slides that illustrate each of those aspects of the presentation. I mentioned it's essential to have a good introductory title slide, and we'll come on to that in a moment. The other aspect of it, which I think is important, is to achieve a balance of the various subtopics within the overall presentation. If you're tr trying to give equal weight to everything, don't add too much to one or two of those aspects of, of the presentation. You need to try and balance it out throughout the display. Moving on then to the introductory slide. I think a short title is a very good idea. And what I always do when I'm planning any new presentation is to try and be as objective as possible, to stand back and think now, how are other people going to receive this? I've got here a particular title I want to use or a particular illustration I want to show. I like it very much. But it doesn't really describe the point that I want or illustrate the point that I want to make. In those circumstances, I think it's best to make the difficult decision and omit that particular item and pick something else, which you think is going to be better received by the audience. So a short title, which emphasizes the subject. Um, you don't want anything that's too gimmicky, vague or obscure, because all people will do is to question, well, what's the subject all about? So we'll look, when we look at some introductory slides in a few moments, we'll look at also at the titles. The background scene, I think, is also important. Um, I'm not in favour, really, of black text on a white background throughout. I think the contrast is too stark. So even with the introductory slide, I like an illustrative background where the colours are not too bold and it demonstrates part of the display that you want to introduce and with a short title superimposed over that background scene. Um, if you use white on black throughout the presentation, I think then it becomes far too stark. And I've heard people say that it becomes boring. So I try and use softer colors and that's much better to superimpose both the text and the illustrations upon it. Also for the introductory slide, it's important to, if you can introduce one or two images or illustrations, providing it doesn't overwhelm the title. Uh, or if you've got a summary on the front page, and we'll see one or two examples of that, uh, it doesn't dominate, or they don't dominate, the text and the message that you're trying to convey in introducing the presentation. Contents of slides then. The slides need to give, and this is a very obvious thing to say, but they need to give information. And that information needs to be relevant. It needs perhaps to include philatelic items rather than just text. The text needs to be concise, but there are exceptions to that. If, for example, you're showing a very important philatelic item which contains a humorous quotation, you can put the illustration on the screen and then repeat the quotation which has got more text to it than you would you would normally want, but just leave the viewers to read that. Visual appeal is also very important. It's got to look nice, it's got to look attractive, it's got to draw people in and make them want to stay with that presentation and to complete it. So try being a bit creative, experiment with combinations of text, uh, philatelic material, photographs, and other ephemera items. Background, I, 
as I said, is very important. I never use white background. I want the softer colors and I can superimpose things on that. And it blends in well and gives a far more overall attractiveness to the slide. Font and style is also important. Um, I would suggest avoiding uh, too many gimmicky features. Things where you have transitions coming in from one side or the other, uh, fade in, fade out, and all the other tricks that can be used because there's a great deal of functionality within PowerPoint. Um, and it's a good idea to experiment with various things, see what they look like. But if you've got too many gimmicky features included where things are fading in, fading out, coming in from one side or the other, et cetera, et cetera. And there's probably about 15 or 20 different features like that that you can introduce. I think it draws the attention of the viewer away from the subject matter that you are talking about because they're then thinking, well, which features he going, what's he going to do next in bringing things in? And that's not the main purpose of, of the exercise. Well, I'll give you one or two demonstrations about font in a moment. Font and style, of course, are important. I think a stylish font can be used principally for a heading, but when you're putting in descriptive text about a philatelic item, I think it's better to use a plainer font. Now, there are some that are, I use quite frequently, um, Tahoma, Verdana, Luc Lucida Sans, uh, and things like that, where you're focusing on what the text is telling you rather than the outline of the letters comprising the text. Photographs and ephemera are also very useful, but those together with philatelic items do try and ensure that you have high quality individual images. The reason for saying that is that the presentation will be viewed by people on many different devices and you want to avoid distortion of the image as much as possible. Um, and if you have high quality, you stand a better chance of those images being transmitted to all of those other devices in the way in which you would like people to see them. Okay, so if we move on and use this uh, example to demonstrate the difference between the use of fonts for a heading and for the text illust illustrating or describing the image. Looking at the Art Nouveau, uh, font first, that's uh, Matura MT Script Capitals, which is fine for anything that is related to Art Nouveau, period, uh, such as the illustration on the right hand side. It's also okay on this occasion for the text underneath, 1903 Christmas card, etc. Um, you can still read it, it's quite clear. Uh, the other text below it is an alternative font which is clearer. However, the situation is rather different when you look at the, at the image on the left-hand side, Art Deco, and the font for that is Broadway. It's excellent for the heading Art Deco or whatever heading you, you would use in an Art Deco period display. But when you look at the text underneath in that particular font, it's much less clear to read. So I would always use the alternative, uh, clearer print uh, that's underneath it on that particular combination. Opening slides then. Um, I'm a bit cautious about using white on any other color, but I did this for the uh, display I did at uh, Washington as part of the sesquicentenary celebrations. And I thought I got away with it. Uh, normally, I would use use black. We've got mature anti script capitals for the highlights of Sudan postal history. Then the summary on the same page of the four main components uh, of the presentation in a clear font, which everybody can instantly read very, very quickly. And three illustrations, an intaglio seal cancel, the Suaki in the Egyptian post office cancellation, and one of the steamers that was used for transmitting mail on the Nile. 
So it has, I think, balance and an instant appeal so that anybody reading it immediately knows exactly what the presentation comprises. Slightly different one. Delarue printed the stamps for the Sudan during that period mentioned there, 1897 to 1991. And I wanted something that represented the Sudan. Now I could have had a Nile scene, but with foliage in the background, you, the text didn't stand out in the way that it should. So I picked this desert scene with the camels in the foreground and the ruins in the background at, at Meroe. And I think it's sufficiently clear to stand out as an opening slide. The second slide in that particular display was the summary of the main issues that Delarue printed for the Sudan during, during that period. And again, it's not a white background, it's very pale, but the text stands out and is particularly clear. During that period, Delarue had a really significant problem because their premises were bombed during World War II and they had great difficulty providing stamps to most of their overseas customers, which meant that they had to use substitute paper, different inks, and there was a lot of local overprinting and surcharging went on uh, in order to provide locally in, in various countries to provide the stamps that were needed. This is just a photograph of the premises as they look after they were severely damaged by a bomb. And of course, if you want to convey something instantly to the people who are viewing the display, then the heading after the blitz and then a short sentence is all that's needed to give a very stark picture of the problem that Delarue faced. Another one that I've used at Sudan, the Camel Postman Stamps. These were issued for nearly a hundred years. So just the title, this time using mature empty script capitals, and then moving on the second slide into the story of the design, choice of, of design production of the Camel Postman Stamps. During the Nile expedition of 1897-98, Kitchener, who was the commanding officer of the expedition, decided that the Sudan should have its own stamps on becoming an independent postal authority. And one of his officers, Captain Stanton, was responsible for map making. And Kitchener had already rejected a, a design um, that had been submitted to him, said to his ADC, let's see what Stanton can do. And there was a very short interview in which Kitchener literally ordered Stanton to designer stamp for the Sudan. Uh, he said, I'll be back in a week. You ought to have it ready for me by then. Uh, it mustn't contain my portrait or that of anyone else. Um, I'll be back in a week. And Stanton was a bit nervous. Uh, and eventually he was able to design the Camel Postman stamp, which is in the top right hand uh, part of the uh, screen there. And those stamps were issued and they replaced the overprinted Egyptian stamps and the cover there is one sent by Stanton himself to his father uh, six weeks before the Camel Postman stamps were issued. Now, that those items together make a very good start to that story. Moving it on a little bit, when Kitchener approved the stamps, he sent this letter to Delarue ordering uh, stamps for the Sudan. And all you need to make this to have the right level of impact is the letter, photograph of Stanton and the title, the Kitchener letter. Moving on then to a different subject, the Zulu War of 1879. Most people remember there was the disaster at Isanduana and a day or so later, the victory at Rock's Drift. How to do an opening slide that conveys those two occurrences. I thought that a contemporary picture, probably uh, somewhat journalistic in, its, in the appearance of both of them in the top left and in the bottom right, representing Isanduana at the top and a relatively 
a modern photograph of the same scene where the picture is totally different. There are cairns and monuments uh, in the foreground. And below, Rourke's Drift, as it appears by an artist in 1880 or thereabouts. And on the left hand side, a modern photograph of Rourke's Drift, where in that building in the foreground is a craft centre now. Totally different. So it's a very good encapsulation, I think, of then and now and superimposed with the word art title, The Zulu War 1879. I said that most people remember Ishandwana and Rourke's Drift, but two months later in March of 1879, there was a very similar situation, a very near miss, uh, almost an, another defeat at Schlaban in Zululand and a victory two days later at Kambula. At Schlaban, Knox Leet, an officer in the 13th Light Infantry, the Somersets, saved the life of Lieutenant Metcalf Smith of the Frontier Light Force. When they got back to the camp, everybody said, what a wonderful thing you did, Knox Leet. You should get the Victoria Cross for, for saving young Metcalf Smith's life. Now, the story here is very, very good because Knox Leet realized, well, I've got a problem because my commanding officer, Colonel Evelyn Wood, is himself the holder of the Victoria Cross and isn't keen to see an increase in the number of recipients. So he wrote a, a series of letters to Colonel Goldsworthy in Ireland, who was the honorary colonel of his regiment. Most postal historians would not include this envelope in their collection because the stamp paying the, the, the six mini rate from South Africa is missing and the, the cover's a bit scruffy. But inside it was the letter that Knox Leet wrote, asking Colonel Goldsworthy if he could um, promote him for getting the, uh, or his attempts to get the Victoria Cross. See what you can do on my behalf. There was a testimonial from Lieutenant Metcalf Smith, whose life he saved, and a report, his report on the Battle of Shaban and the Battle of Kambula. Now, this is one of those postal history items where the inside story is the thing that, that tells everything. The cover is nothing. And eventually Knox Leap was awarded the Victoria Cross. So we have the v VC in the top right-hand corner, the title Blood on the Painted Mountain, because Schlaban in Zulu means Painted Mountain, and the picture of the cover and Knox Leap and his comment about the engagement at Schlaban that immediate, immediately became apparent that the catastrophe was inevitable. A similar one, the Boer invasion of Tal Siege of Ladysmith. Sometimes a map is very useful. I'll come to that in, in a moment. The Boer forces invaded Natal from the Orange Free State and the Transvaal. And there were about 27, 28,000 Boer troops. The British in northern Natal had about 12,000. This gives you an example of the type of terrain through the Drakensberg Mountains through which the soldiers advanced and the British had to retreat. So that short title at the top and the setting in which the war took place. But it's one of those instances where a map is very, very useful. If you look at the red outline with Newcastle here and Dundee here, and those towns fell very quickly to the Boer forces and the British troops retreated to Ladysmith here. And that was besieged from the 5th of November until the end of 1899, until the end of February 1900. So it immediately gives the viewer a mental picture of what happened and the difficulty of defending that triangular, almost triangular piece of territory with fewer troops than those who were invading. 
sometimes it's a good idea also to use a very ordinary cover with a letter that's very interesting. Again, this is another example that Sergeant Parry is writing to his mother saying why he's been called to give evidence at the Board of Inquiry or the Court Martial. And this slide is constructed with just the short title, the armoured train at Cheverley. The other person who was aboard that train was Winston Churchill. And he was taken prisoner by the Boers and then subsequently escaped from uh, another part of South Africa where he'd been uh, incarcerated and uh, eventually got home. So uh, it's another example of the inside story where the cover is very ordinary and the letter tells a story that is worth repeating. This represents a presentation I've done to a U3A, University of the Third Age audience. Similar things would be appropriate, lunch clubs, round table, that sort of organization. And I chose the subject as being the inside story. Looking at the importance of written communication through the ages and how mail was carried. A couple of illustrations, and this is the title sheet. Letter writing is becoming obsolete. Well, yes, everybody sends emails these days, but you need something, and I think this draws attention from the outset. The second slide, in, in this case, because it's a non philatelic audience, it's very important, I think, to do a summary. So, looking at those subjects there, key points in time for the development of mail services, letter writing, etc., and some of the historical letters, how they were carried, and then what happened unexpectedly and dealing with some illustrated matters at the end with appropriate illustrations as to how mail was carried. So it brings it alive. It's not just a page with some text on it. Looking then at a forerunner before there were general posts. This was sent from Carl Shalton on, or to Carl Shalton on the 3rd of April, 1630 uh, by The, uh, or to Sir Henry Burton, Knight of the Bath at its house in Carshalton. And it, Burton was asked on behalf of one of the uh, central persons in, in, in London to intervene on behalf of a prisoner who was due to appear at Rygate Assizes and also to consult the uh, Sir Thomas Carew, the knight who held his uh, manorial residence in Beddington in Surrey. This was used to illustrate the postal rates and how expensive things were and how they were calculated in 1811. So even when somebody was buying a few pipes of oldest and best wines, um, it's it's goes by cross post from Chester to Falmouth and then looking at the calculation it was two and five pence to send that letter. The next one was it even more expensive letter from Haiti to London via New York and Liverpool and uh, this was charged with a triple rate letter at four shillings and nine pence. Now in today's money that would be a considerable sum and I think all these developments contributed to the change, the vast change in uh, postal reform in uh, the 18, for early 1840s. Modern letters can also be very, very interesting. And this is a good example of family correspondence that many people who attend, um, say, a philatelic display at a non philatelic uh, gathering. It's useful to say everyone's got old letters at home. Or most people have and their family correspondence can go back decades or even centuries. And much of it is never looked at. So it's very important to get retrieve these these things and see what's inside. This is a very, very ordinary horses air letter to Ceylon, as it then was. 
by Tony Drayton, whose sister was serving with the Wrens uh, in Colombo. The key thing here is the postmark, the 10th of May, 1945. And this air letter describes in graphic language the scenes in London following the VE Day celebrate or during the VE Day celebrations. We toddled off to a pub in Sloan Square and had a few gins before lunch. And then we went down to the palace to see the King and Queen of Winston Churchill come out onto the balcony. And so it went on with inebriated servicemen hanging from all the lampposts. Whoopee, what a day we had. Our commandant was grand. We all went back mad together. And this was something that after my mother-in-law died, the recipient of the letter, her sister, gave this to my wife and said, you'd better have this because this was the letter that your mother wrote to me when I was in serving in Colombo. So family correspondence is very important to look at this because grandparents, grandfathers, and great grandparents served in the forces during World War II, World War I, and they're important items and they tell a story. This is a, a letter signed by General Gordon when he traveled from Gondokoro on the Uganda border to Khartoum and it took him 11 days and he says everybody was surprised I got over that length over that distance in such a short period of time he talks about slavers and he talks about other incidents that occurred on the journey uh, along the Nile but um, this is one of those occasions where I think what brings it to to life or to reality is the picture of Gordon his steamer and then the quotation about the problem he had with the hippopotamus keeping him awake at night and then losing uh, his soap and his shaving brush because he, on the Nile uh, in 1874 you couldn't just pop into the local store and buy something to replace them. I mentioned earlier about incidents that occur which prevent the mail being delivered as was intended, looted mail during the Anglo-Boer War. The Boers looted the Rudval station on the 7th of June 1900 and from the illustrated London news there are pictures of the Boers looting the British stores and the Highlanders a few days later searching amongst the deb debris of the destroyed mail bags. All the mail was stamped, recovered from mails looted by Boers on June the 8th. Actually that is incorrect because it should read recovered from mails on June the 8th or recovered on June the 8th from males looted by the Boers on June the 7th. A little bit of pedantry on my part. It's also a good idea to include some amusing items. And here we've got a couple of illustrated envelopes. During the Anglo-Boer War, British soldiers, if they were on guard in remote locations, then they had time on their hands and a lot of them resorted to uh, illustrating covers and envelopes documents uh, and making souvenirs uh, to, to bring home when the campaign's finished so there's a couple here keep out of Devet. Devet, of course was one of the leading Boer um, generals and news from the seat of war Lord Robertson Kruger this one I, I particularly like, which also is an amusing put together of a debacle that took place. Lord Methuen was in charge. And at uh, Tweebosch on the 7th of March, 1902, uh, there was a disaster for the British troops. And uh, we weren't popular on the continent at the, during the Anglo-Boer War. And there were lots of comic postcards produced in France and other countries. And this one here at the top right hand side, you see uh, Kruger applying a spanking to uh, King Edward VII with uh, Gladstone and Chamberlain standing by looking very embarrassed indeed. A letter from, uh, or not cover from Lord Matthew into his wife and another postcard at the bottom right hand side. Um, he was the only general to be captured by the Boer forces and was described by Winston Churchill as the general who could always be relied upon to snatch defeat 
from the jaws of victory. <clears throat> Another example of illustrating an incident on the third northward flight, this was the series of proving flights to establish whether it was feasible to have uh, regular flights between Khartoum and Kisumu. And on the third northward flight, the plane came down four times. And with all the mailbags on board, how do you retrieve the mail? Well, this is 1927. It's East Africa. You improvise, you bring up a crane, hook it up to the plane and drag it from the water. Thereby doing a lot more damage than when it hit the surface in, in, in the first place. This is made up, obviously, some text, a map showing the route down East Africa from Egypt through the Sudan and down to Lake Victoria. Photograph of the aeroplane having been dragged from the water and then one of the covers that was rescued with the cache um, or part of the cache on it. But the, th the part that I like is are the photographs because there's a whole series of them that I've got and one demonstrates as clearly as anybody could what happened to the mail once it was retrieved from the lake. So here we see the staff of the post office on their hands and knees, drying all the mail out on sacks. And the postmaster is standing by watching what's happening, leaning up against the cart on one leg, pith helmet on head, smoking a cigarette and holding his pet monkey. He's not doing anything, so clearly he's supervising. And that encapsulates the end of that particular event. Similarly, Another pioneering flight was the one undertaken by Laurie Bonney, the first flight from Brisbane to Cape Town. This was via India and uh, the Middle East and down through Egypt and into the Sudan. The philatelic covers, first flight cover. Laurie Bonney was a character. She was reputed to dry her washing in the slipstream of her aeroplane. Now that story may be apocryphal because what we're not told is how she managed to retrieve the washing before the plane landed. She also, uh, after she married, she decided not to get in involved in her husband's engineering business. And she took up flying. When her husband discovered what was happening, he supported all her flying activities, bought her an aeroplane. And when she was away on her, these, first flights that she undertook and, and she was the first person to circumnavigate Australia. She used to leave her husband sufficient menus so that he could cook his own meals while she was away. Now, the incident here at uh, Malakal, when the plane was damaged, it was manhandled to the banks of the Nile by the RAF, put onto a barge and taken down to, taken up to uh, Khartoum and repaired. And then she continued her flight and she flew, I think, 18,000 miles in about 37 days, although there was a several days would, would have been taken following the accident in order to repair the plane so that she could continue. The final stage that I want to describe is finishing your PowerPoint presentation. You want, as well as having a beginning, a middle and an end, you want something that's interesting to conclude. Now, using the Camel Postman, this is, is, is quite a good story because Stanton knew nothing of the issue of the stamps until they actually arrived and were being used. And he said to um, Jimmy Watson Kitchener's ADC, look, I'd like to have a, a set of the stamps on a piece of paper signed by Kay, as they called Kitchener, um, as a souvenir. And uh, that you can see Stanton's, uh, Watson's reply to Stanton. Now, this signed letter and set of stamps was presented to Stanton, and his descendants, unfortunately, had it framed and it was hung in a bathroom. And of course, the atmospheric conditions to which it was uh, subjected meant that the colours of a lot of the stamps uh, have faded, and that was 
due to Della using Fugitive Inc. Um, this is a family item of in the descendants of Stanton, and with the descendants of Stanton. And this uh, we was produced at the centenary of the uh, Camel Postman uh, weekend that the Sudan Study Group held in 1998. And with the consent of the existing owners, because it'll never come on the market, it was probably the most photocopied item that weekend. One or two other uh, ones, if you want something that's total humour, the uh, ingredients or the recipe for camel stew, uh, this does exist, although I, I haven't tried it, but I've seen it. it it's not a particularly attractive um, confection. Uh, these ingredients here, it's all humorous, it's thoroughly overdone, but it's a way to conclude, particularly with a non-philatelic audience, um, well, part of the story about the camel postman. I do like the bit about the two small rabbits and that it will serve 3,800 people, and if more people are expected, add the two rabbits. And then finally, also at the uh, non-philatelic um, presentation. I thought that this was quite a good uh, slide to conclude with. It's some postal arrangements that are in force at Vivonne Bay on Kangaroo Island off the coast of Adelaide. And when we were there some years ago, um, the, we took a day trip around Kangaroo Island and there were a couple of uh, post offices which had been converted to uh, other uses. And I took photographs of them and the uh, our guide said, oh, are you interested in post offices? I said, yes, I am. So uh, he said, well, I'll show you some post boxes. And when we got to Vivon Bay, the local residents had used all types of uh, boxes and other arrangements to have their mail delivered. And uh, as you can see, um, one might say that the uh, in the bottom right hand corner, the refrigerator well that could be used for returned mail to keep it cool in a cool in a hot climate the next one the dustbin well clearly that's for uh, junk mail and the microwave in the top left hand corner well one can only say that that's for hot mail and that ladies and gentlemen concludes this presentation on the preparation of a powerpoint presentation thank you very much indeed for your attention i hope that you've enjoyed the presentation. Thank you very much and it's back to you Mark. Thank you very much Richard. Uh, if you'd like to stop sharing your screen, thank you. Okay. Um, excellent, thank you very much. Well, we will move to some Q&A. Um, rem uh, just to remind everybody, uh, particularly those who arrived just after I mentioned it initially, um, if you'd like to raise a question, please use the Q&A facility, which is at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You can make that appear by putting your mouse pointer over your Zoom screen, or indeed by pressing the Alt key on your keyboard. That also brings up that control bar. And there's a Q&A facility there. Um, rather that you put your questions in the Q&A than, than in the chat, otherwise it means I've got to look in two places at once. Um, so we've already got one question, Richard. It's partly a question, partly a comment. Um, it was with respect to using word art. Um, you you gave an example there of, uh, with your Zulu war slide. Mm. The question is really, is that is that really to be considered as good style? The the person who's asking the question, uh, Marcos Pave, Marcos says he feels that it's almost a really good example that you should always stray away from using word art because it's rarely considered in his opinion as good style i mean what, what in, in general how what, what what would your comment be about using such things as word art oh I'd, I'd use it very sparingly um in fact if i was putting that slide together today i'm not sure i would have used that it's probably 10 years ago 12 years ago that i I put that slide together. Um, you want something that draws attention to the overall subject and I think uses those four images. If you had just the images, 
you wouldn't be able to tell what it was unless you were familiar with uh, those particular uh, photographs and uh, all the artistic Im images and Isandwana. Um, so it's one to just show very, very quickly and move on. I wouldn't indulge in word art to any great extent, but I wanted um, something that was dramatic. It's a bit yes. low key, I agree. Mm. Yes, yeah. Right, well, th uh, so yeah, so thank you, Marcos, for that question. That was uh, uh, clearly a, a, a very relevant uh, to, mm. as you said, Richard, to the way that you want to make an impression in, in the presentation and how to convey um, the, the, the subject matter. Um, okay, well, next question now comes from one of our anonymous attendees. Question is, okay, uh, this is obviously a personal question for you, Richard. He says, do you uh, prefer sans serif or serif font when it comes to the text in a PowerPoint presentation? I use both. I use shadow as well sometimes, particularly on a title, if you want to soften the outline. Um, but I don't have a pref an absolute preference. I just okay. play around with three or four things and then put them out. And the one I think is the most suitable when the whole thing is constructed, because sometimes I've had the background, put the title up, then put some other images or text in and then thought, no, 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 that title's not right and changed it for something else. So yeah. it is a fairly iterative process. Um, I don't finalize the things until I've got everything on the screen and I think, yeah, that looks better than this and move things around. Okay. On the subject of layout and uh, composition, um, Hugh Williams asked, how do you decide which template to use when compiling a presentation? Um, only by experimentation. I will go, I don't like ornamental borders because I think they're distracting. I have used them and I move away from that now. I think the softer images of a light colored background is much better because what you're drawing attention to is the images that you show and the text, particularly the title. And if you've got ornamental borders, it tends to distract. So okay. the, the mm -hmm. soft where it fades from one side to the other, I, that's the, the approach I prefer. Okay, thank you. Um, Trevor Larkins is obviously uh, interested in, in how you put together PowerPoint, given that you've got a display. So he says, how easy is it to transcribe what he describes as an analog display, i.e. a physical display, into PowerPoint? It can be, it depends on the size of the display. If, for example, you're showing 128 pages, say a standard eight frame exhibit, that I think is going to be easier than if you're showing six or 700 pages because you've got more <coughs> effort, excuse me more effort needed to choose what to include and what to omit with the very large presentations you also got to decide i think as i mentioned earlier that if you've got a big display you either do a high level overview of everything or you do an introductory uh, series of probably half a dozen slides to give the main ingredients of it, the main sections, and then pick one but to do in much more detail. Um, so it is, a, again, an iterative process because the decision is you've got to, if you're limited to 30 or 35 slides, you have to leave out an awful lot of things. And if you've got 10 subjects, say in a 128 page um, display, you want the best of the items and the most dramatic to get across 
because all you're ever showing is a selection. You can back that up, and we do this at the Royal with a flip book. So that people, but they can't see that at the time they're viewing the physical display. They can only view that later. I did that last year with one of my presentations um, once the, the lockdown started. And I think it, it can work very well. Um, if you've got a complete specialized story, that doesn't, that's not ideal for a PowerPoint presentation necessarily. Maybe the proofs yeah. and color trials and essays are, but all the shades and other things like that, it's ideal to go into a flip book and let people who want to see more look at that afterwards. Okay, thank you. Okay, we've got uh, three, four questions now to get through in the next couple of minutes. So okay, uh, let's fine. see if we can see if we can get through those. Um, the first one, Ian Matheson is commenting on the fact that whilst you did mention about transitions and you talked about uh, not using too many of those transitions from one slide to another, he feels that you didn't really discuss the use of animation. He says, if the storyline is being led by the spoken narrative instead of the slides, he feels it allows you the time to include comments or visuals for better effect because mm. the viewer is not distracted by reading text when you are talking. I mean, what I guess what, what, what he's asking is, what's your view of the use of animation? I tend not to, I tend not to use it, but that's my choice. I'm not saying that's the ideal way to do it because there are some subjects and we've seen them at the Royal. Now, if you saw Sayurita Larkso's Paris by Night in December, as the Christmas meeting in December 2019, that was the way to deal with animation because the subject, those Art Nouveau postcards are, and everything else that went with it is the ideal way to feature, feature it using animation, but it doesn't suit everything. Now, I, I prefer the more straightforward approach, but that's only my choice. I think it is fair to say, uh, in answer to the question, that if animation lends itself to the subject, yeah. then by all means use it. But I, I also agree with you generally, having done an awful lot of presentations myself, that overuse of animations just, it, it, it clutters the thing up and you're not quite sure what it is you're looking at. So mm. it's about almost to use that, that rather unusual phrase, horses for courses. If it's relevant to use animations because it, it it helps tell the story, then do so. Otherwise, don't. Yeah. Right. Moving on to um, more general questions. Uh, Gerald asks, what is the maximum number of slides in an evening presentation? So he's looking for some guidance there. It could. I would think somewhere between 30 and 40. OK, right. 40 is the top end, although I have seen exceptions to that where somebody has whizzed through 60, 65. But it depends upon the content of the, the subject and it depends upon how the rest of the presentation goes and how much talking there is as well. Okay. Right. Uh, Rex Dixon asks, how do you decide what shape your slide uh, what shape slides to use? He, he noted that in your in, in the today that the uh, side size of the slides that you were using seems to be somewhat different from the shape of a full screen. So yeah, so hence his question about decisions about what 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 size of slides to use. I think it trial and error. You try the wide screen. I've tried the right wide screen, um, and. You've, if you're using slides on the square screen, the older format, um, then you've pr probably got to reformat most of your slides in order to get them into the wide screen. Now, a lot of the ones I showed today are built up from a series of presentations I've done over, over a period of time in the okay. old format. Okay. So, yeah, if it fits, do it that particular way. If it doesn't, do it the other way. Yeah, because uh, yeah, the point that I think that Rex is making is that there are 
you can you can size your slides with different aspect ratios and uh, yeah to, to better fit uh, the, the the screen good um stephen parkin asks would you recommend applying borders to covers or illustrations which largely have a cream or white paper when you show it against a similar cream cream colored background i would i would choose that method yes uh, but it would should be a very fine border not a heavy border so that it looks like a morning cover um yeah yes indeed yeah you don't need to have a very narrow thing around it i've used that where if you've got a cover that is the only thing that you can use to illustrate a particular point and it's ragged then crop it the image and put the board around it i've done that yes it, it, it needs it's a good point to make up, actually Yes. yes, it does. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, on the subject of uh, material to show, Angie asks, in a stamp presentation, is it wiser, in your opinion, to use samples in blocks of four rather than a bunch of single stamps? I would use a mix of the two. Um, it depends upon the length of the story that you, and how many slides you need to... Uh, include in order to tell it um i've used mostly though single stamps and you can enlarge the image particularly if you've got an overprint or a variety or an aspect of it that you want to highlight okay philip reynolds has recently watched a zoom presentation that included a couple of short videos which seem to go down well uh would you agree that the incorporation of little videos in, in a presentation uh, is, is a good thing? In the right circumstances, absolutely. Yes, I would. Right, good. Yeah, that's a very good point that Phil makes that, yeah, um, sometimes the embedding videos in a presentation works quite well. Yeah. The final question that I'm seeing at the moment, because we are very near, nearly uh, at the end, I, I would like to make this the last question, ladies and gentlemen, because of the time. Ralph uh, Stuttard is uh, mentioning there's been much discussion in the Stampex chat rooms about the future of exhibiting and that digital multimedia displays are the way forward. So he asks, how do, we how do you envisage that things, that things like that will progress? I think I said in doing the vote of thanks the other, e the other day that um, with virtual presentations using PowerPoint and other uh, functionality, that having let that genie out of the bottle, you've, there's, there's no way we can get it back in there or would want to get it back in there. Right. I think that a mixed approach is, is the answer. If okay. you're talking about competitive exhibiting, my own opinion is, and I know others don't We've agree. We've only got a minute left, Richard. So, Sorry, um, I know that others don't okay. agree with this, that yeah. there's no substitute for actually seeing the material in situ. And this is why at the Royal, we're now allowing PowerPoint presentations with, or encouraging PowerPoint presentations with a one o'clock display. Okay. So Brilliant. I think it's gonna be a mixed approach. Imagine. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Sorry to rush you, but that no, was the okay. final question. All I do want to say to everybody is, if you've got more questions, please do come by the Royal Stand, uh, yeah, booth B2 where you can chat with uh, people from the Royal about all these topics. Um, there's some great questions, great ideas to be discussed. So do drop by and, and, uh, and, and come and see us. So thank you very much, all of you, for attending. I hope you found it instructive. And I hope also you enjoy the rest of Virtual Stampex. So I'm going to end this now. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you again, Richard.